Wipe off your shirt, and it'll uh, and it'll get it better. So yeah, hi. Right. Still have power in the building. I was wishing that uh, when they got new squad two, that it'd be like FBI style. Just after 9.30, uh, crews got called out to the 8900 block of Reno Mill Road for an apartment fire. The crews arrived on scene. They saw a two-story apartment complex with heavy fire showing uh, from upstairs. Ultimately, we had some water issues with hydrants here on location. In addition to, we had lines laid across uh, some of the streets coming into the complex that were getting run over uh, by the public, running over our supply lines. So we had some water issues to get a good handle on it up first. It took us about an hour to bring the fire under control. Um, I think all in all, there were about 16 units that were affected by either uh, fire, smoke, or, or water damage. Um, there was reported of one civilian injury, but that, that, that first was never found by us or by MedStar. Um, so the, the fire was brought under control, like I said, about an hour later, uh, and they're still trying to just mop up the hot spots and make sure the fire is completely out. What, how many firefighters are here? Well, like I said, we had two alarms. We probably got approximately, it made me do math. Um, We'll say probably roughly around 50 firefighters. Somebody said that there was a building collapse, roof collapse. Yeah, so there was there was partial collapse uh, on the west side of the building, uh, which which kind of also hampered our uh, fire attack. We had to take a, take a different tactic uh, to get around that to make sure our crew were safe as they were bound in this place. How did the call come in? Did it just come in as just a normal fire, or was it? We just got dispatched out to an to an apartment fire. Um, yeah. Talk about, it. I guess, firefighters had to go defensive. Yeah, so anytime we start having partial collapses and just uh, structural integrity of the buildings that we're fighting, that takes us from going inside to put the fire out with what we call hand lines uh, to make sure our people, you know, are safe. We'll pull them outside of that building and we'll, what we call setting up the sticks or, or setting up the tower um, and spraying water from the ladder pipes. Everybody comes outside. We make sure that everybody's accounted for that was inside. Uh, so we'll do kind of what we call it a par, but it's basically a roll call of all the companies and crews that are here on scene before we start flooding uh, those those buildings with, with heavy water from the big trucks. How hard is it to fight a fire like this when you've got the issues that you have with people running over hoses, lack of water? I mean, what's the challenge? Well, it's that, that, that is the challenge, right? When you don't have any water, it's tough to put the fire out. So anytime, you know, we, we ask the public, if you ever come across a fire scene, if you see any supply lines going across the road, they could be different colors depending on what cities you're in. They can be yellow, blue, what we here, have here in full water. Uh, but please do not run those over. Those those lines are our are, are family's lifelines. Um, if our people are deep inside of one of those buildings, they, they need that water uh, to be able to make sure if something goes wrong, we can back out. And have that water as a protection for our, for our crew and, and for the people that we're searching for as well. So if you ever come across one of those supply lines in a row, stop, turn around, or just don't progress any further because that could be our brothers and sisters' lives that are inside. Was the fire initially contained to this one? We talked talked to one witness said it was behind his apartment. Was it contained to this one, and then it's the call from there? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how many units were affected when our when our crews arrived on the scene. Um, but ultimately, like I said, with some water issues and stuff that we had, uh, it, it, it doesn't take long. Some of these uh, units, not necessarily here, but they have common attics. It sounds like the firewalls and stuff that are that are put in there by code to, for protection to keep that fire from spreading work pretty well in, in this instance today. Uh, but yeah, anytime you're, you're trying to put the fire out and you're having water issues, that, that kind of takes a toll.
So if I was made, uh, was uh, controlled just the one building, didn't jump to another building next to it? Correct. There may be some smoke damage and things of that nature in some of the surrounding buildings, but as far as fire uh, damage, I don't believe there's any fire damage to any of the uh, exposure, exposing buildings. How many residents are displayed? We're still trying to come up with the count right now. Some of, from my understanding, some of these units were affected, 16 units total that were affected. Some of those units were vacant at the time, so they're still trying to come up with a good count as residents come back home um, from a night out in town and everything else to figure out how Red, many Red Cross is coming through? Correct, yeah. Red Cross has been notified, um, so they'll be here to assist uh, these, these residents with anything that they need. With this amount of damage, and we know partial collapse, which means obviously major damage inside, and we've heard command talk about not going to the side of the, the building where all the meters are, which kills all the power to the building. Okay. And we've seen one apartment complex or one apartment constantly spark. When you're not able to get the power turned off and you still need to do search and clear everything and do hotspots, yeah. how does that hamper? How do you deal with something like that? Well, so anytime I mean, our, we, we've got a dangerous job, right? Uh, life safety is always going to be our first top priority of, of, of any uh, incident that we run on. So even though there may be electrical that's popping and arcing and, and, and flashing in the background, we've got to go in there and make sure that there's nobody that's inside that we need to bring out. And that's, that's number one for us. Uh, it, it does kind of play into how strategic we are when it comes across those different tactics that we've utilized to, to try to go find those victims. Um, in today's deal, we've got good partnerships with Encore, uh, some of the utility companies, Atlas, and things like that. So we'll call them out there to kind of help us assist in uh, getting those challenges taken care of so everybody's a little bit more safe and safe. When you get something like this where we've heard talks about possible animal fatalities and stuff like that, how do you go about letting up somebody know that they have lost some, they have lost what a lot of people will treat as their child as some, something they've maybe raised as from a baby. How do you approach that part of the job? Well, and, and, and that's a good question. And, and, and that's a tough part of the job. I mean, like you said, I mean, it, there's there's times we roll up on scene and somebody says, my baby's inside. To me, when I hear that, it's, it's somebody's child. But, but these days, more and more, it seems to be more pets and things of that nature. Like I said, we're going to go in there and do whatever we can. If there's a life that we can save, we're going to do what we can to get that life out. Uh, we, we do appreciate uh, if, if we step off the truck in, in a fire situation, you know, tell us, is it, is, it, is it your kid? Is it a dog? Is it a cat? How big is it? That way we kind of know what we're looking for. You know, I, I say it all the time when we show up on these scenes, it's not like the movies in Hollywood where you can see everything inside. Uh, real world of firefighting is most of the time with the smoke and everything that's, that's, that's coming down on you. You can't see your hand in front of your face. So you're walking into a complete unknown, um, most of the time feeling around, trying to figure out is that a body? Is that a couch? Um, is that an animal? Uh, so it, it it does. And so when when, when that fatalities do happen, um, that's that's part of the job for us to go out there and tell those tenants or or homeowners that um, unfortunately we, we found your pet and didn't make it, or we, we were able to find your pet and bring it outside and revive it. And it's you know sometimes we'll see them out there running around in the front yard good as new. So is there anything unique in fighting this fire that might be different from fighting like, some of the other fires? Anything well, you know, I mean, it's it's anytime you're fighting a, an apartment complex with two stories, even even more than just a two story home, you know, it's a bigger, more square footage to search, uh, more square footage for the fire to extend to. Uh, you've got to go out and make sure that that fire is not taken over, uh, you know, or even in this case, another exposing building. Uh, you know, the typical house fires. Uh, we bought those pretty quite a bit, um, but but every fire is different and, and, and dynamic and, and has some challenges. So when we run into this, we we, we kind of prepare ourselves mentally from from an apartment uh, fire that's called in versus residential structure fire or commercial fire. Before we ever step on the truck, our minds are already going with what a, what a game plan is for, for attacking that type of fire. But we can show up on scene; it can be something completely different. Um, thankfully, we're, we're we're very well trained here in Fort Worth. Uh, we're, we're given a lot of resources, a lot of equipment uh, that really helps us do our jobs a lot better. Um, we're pretty proud of the job that we do. No firefighters injured. Correct. Yeah. No. no Just one civilian possibly injured. One civilian possibly. I mean, like I said, there was a there was a, a call that came in 
In addition to this, somewhere here in the same complex, we don't know if they were tied together or not. And then uh, I get, I take it, Arson of Mount there. You know, Correct. Yeah, they're already here on the scene talking with, with uh, witnesses and people that live here trying to come up and they can figure out what the cause of place. And we have here in, Fort, in Tarrant County, mainly in Fort Worth, we have so many fire stations strategically placed all over the place. Can you talk about how big of a difference this fire made with seven being a mile and a half away? If it could, if they were somewhere else, how how worse this could have possibly have been? Yeah, every, everything goes back to response time, right? Like you said, there's there's a strategy that's behind the location of all the stations here in Fort Worth, just like there is in any other city uh, in the world. It, it, it comes down to, to how far is that station away from, from any kind of possibility before another station needs to be built and brought in. So, um, like I said, we're, we're very fortunate here in Fort Worth. We've got we've got a lot of resources uh, that, that tie back in together. Uh, we, we get to fight fire with one another, train with each other. Uh, make sure that we're all on the same page, and, and that really helps us out in instances like this. 